Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third session of the Global Protection Forum from the ground up. As the title suggests, in the face of increasingly complex conflict, of course, as you know, local actors often form the front line of civilian protection. This locally led efforts driven by those closest to affected communities play a critical role, leveraging trusted relationship, adaptability, and a deep understanding of local dynamics to protect civilians amid armed conflict. With our excellent moderator, we are very lucky to have uh, Gemma Davis, a senior research fellow at ODI with extensive field experience. Our speakers will share insights into these local protection efforts, shedding light on both the achievements and challenges encountered on the ground. Thank you once again for joining us, and uh, we look forward to a meaningful exchange on strengthening the protection of civilians worldwide, especially in these very challenging times when critical norms are at risk. So uh, no um, additional delays. Uh, Gemma, we are in your very good hands. Over to you. Many thanks, Hoda. Um, and thanks. I'm I'm delighted to be here today uh, to, to moderate this event, uh, which um, we'll learn from locally led efforts to protect civilians, um, understand how local actors are engaging duty bearers and armed actors, and ultimately how they're trying to reduce violence and strengthen protection, um, as well as understand what is needed to further strengthen such efforts and how we can learn from some from some of their experiences. Um, it's very relevant to some of the work that we've been carrying out over the last few years, um, which looks at um, efforts to reduce violence and strengthen the protection of civilians through community dialogue with armed actors. Um, so hopefully a, a really rich discussion today. So delighted to uh, introduce our panelists who are from a really rich and diverse set of contexts and experiences for this session. We have, um, first of all, um, Ayan Abdirashid Alid, um, who is a researcher and lawyer from Somalia. Then we'll hear from Elur, a program manager uh, from, uh, from SOPROP in DRC. Uh, then we'll hear from Anton Yaremchuk. He's the co-founder and executive director from Base in Ukraine. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Sophie Lin Omajang, Senior Protection Officer from UNHCR in Chad. Um, so welcome to all of you. And again, thank you so much uh, to all of you joining us here today. So I am, let's uh, start with you. Um, oh, and uh, apologies. Also, we have Niai, um, who, who is also joining us. Sorry to, <laughs> to miss you off there, Niai. Um, okay. Um, I am, please, uh, if, if you can tell us, you've got rich experience, um, in research findings in terms of how Somali elders are using traditional, um, and cultural norms, as well as religious teachings to support protection of civilians, IHL compliance, um, amidst conflict, um, in different communities. So tell us a bit about your research, what it, what you found and what the key learnings are that we can consider, um, to strengthen the efforts of local actors and community members. Thank you, Gemma. Hi, everyone, and thank you for your time and your attention today. I always like to start off by saying peace upon everybody around me. So peace upon, be upon you all. Um, I'll begin briefly by introducing my research, which concerns, among other things, the traditional Somali laws of war. And for about two years now, I've been researching and I've traveled to Somalia to conduct interviews so that I can really relay what these traditional laws of restraint and protection consist of with a certain authority. So my interviews have consisted uh, of current clan leaders, ulama or clerics, or they are, which are traditional male elders, academics, and a few others. The findings from my interviews are, I think, grounded in the words and the lived experiences of these elders who are so revered in their communities, and they hold such a deep understanding of the Somali customary and religious laws. So it's through their guidance that they uphold this system of restraint and protection that serves as a critical buffer for civilians. The other thing that I will mention about Somali society is that Somalis organize at the genealogical level 
or at the clan level. There are hundreds of clans in Somalia, although it is said that Somalis come from or share ancestry from two brothers, centuries and centuries ago. Even where there are so many clans, the tra traditional laws has remained consistent and constant among the clans. So every Somali knows who the Birmageda are or those who are spared from the spear or what we know in English as civilians. To understand how civilian protection is managed in Somali society, we need to look at the central role of the Somali elders, uh, which we know as Odeal, and more so in the regional areas and not uh, in the major cities, given they have such a, a stronghold in, in regional areas. Uh, every So the elders are a collective of respective, respected leaders who hold various titles and responsibilities. Every clan has their own group of Odeal, and they're vested with the responsibility to administer and ensure and adherence to the traditional laws of restraint and the protection of civilians. I might introduce who the key figures are among these elders. There's the cleric who brings religious wisdom. There's the clan leader who represents the interests of his lineage, the Nabadon or the peace seeker who constantly advocates for harmony, and the Ulugudud who are known as the red cane men or elders that are sometimes likened to historians as they carry ancestral knowledge of custom and, and past agreements. They're all deeply respected for their knowledge of cust Somali customary law. And then we have the poet, who is a res very well-respected figure whose words carry both historical weight and moral significance. So together, these elders are all tasked with the administration of her, where the traditional law of protection and where the practice of restraint, especially during conflict, emerges. They bear the heavy responsibility of preserving peace, and not only through rules, but ensuring that the community's adherence to the traditional laws is maintained. So a central element of this traditional system is the principles of Birmageiro, those who were spared from the spear. The principles are entrenched in traditional Somali law, uh, where the protection for particularly women, children, the elderly, the sick, the vulnerable, the clerics, the clan leaders, the poets, and essentially everybody we know as non-combatants. In addition to her, Somali elders rely on uh, the Sharia, which is the Islamic legal frameworks, and this is where we find that the traditional laws and the sharia are a pace with each other in terms of restraint and protection. Elders ensure that both her and the sharia are upheld and so a dual layer of moral and legal authority is created. The Birmageda also uh, represents this ancestral code of conduct and it elevates the, the protection of vulnerable groups into a sacrosanct duty. I find that it mandates these individuals, regardless of their clan affiliations or the ferocity of surrounding hostilities, are all to be shielded from harm, you know, both symbolically and, and practically, uh, they're to be spared from the spear. Um, and so the, in this in this way, the Birmageda acts as an eth ethical fulcrum where the values of honour and restraint are balanced against the impulses of vengeance and violence. Um, so the elders are all entrusted with interpreting and enforcing the Birmageda across the clans. Uh, their roles to ensure that doctrines of civilian immunity are not only acknowledged, but internalized by all members of society and members of each clan. Um, through their revered status, you see that they ingrain within the community a sense of collective accountability, uh, a shared understanding that any violation of the Birmageda not only dishonors the individual, but it casts a shadow over the entire clan. And so protection is in this sense communal. Every member is sentinel and each bears a fragment of the duty to uphold these sac sacred exemptions. Uh, this creates a powerful deterrent, I have found, and a, a moral barricade of, of sorts that's uh, fortified by the weight of tradition and the knowledge that transgressions invite both shame and retribution. Um, and I wouldn't be doing the Somali justice if I didn't turn your attention to the medium in which these laws are expressed which is, of course, through the oral poetry and the broader Somali literary culture. The poet is a very revered figure who wields an exclusive authority over words, and he's historically rivaled that of warriors. And uh, we also know that poets uh, wielded the capacity to wage war with their words, but also protect peace. Uh, the, per the poet's verses are laden with very elusive imagery. He speaks of resilience with mercy, honour with restraint, and justice with compassion. He pulls the listener close uh, and deep into the heart of the ideals that are being exalted or scrutinized, and you find that the listener is caused to embody them. Uh, a well-rendered poem is not merely heard. Uh, a lot of Somalis will tell you that it's very much felt, uh, and you can describe it almost like a, a, 
a, a blade being wielded that cleaves through the layers of the Somali psyche. Um, it pierces both the mind and the spirit. Uh, and the audience is never passively receiving the messages. Um, so the ideals of sparing the innocent are, is glorified as the hallmark of a just warrior or a just uh, a combatant. And, you know, sometimes they're, they're attributed, uh, you know, being b- belonging to an honourable clan or possessing a noble heart. And it's because Somalis are very mindful of the aman or the praise that they receive in society. The poet's voice is revered in Somali culture and we find that it becomes a mouthpiece for these principles, um, articulating, you know, in stirring verses, the beauty of restraint and the humiliation of indiscriminate violence. Um, so from these elders, I guess there are several essential lesson, lessons that we can draw. The first one that appeared to me was probably localizing the peace building process. There's much importance um, in localizing, I think, and Somali elders are deeply respected. They're trusted figures. Their authority within the community means that when they advocate for peace, people listen and uh, they feel a sense of personal investment. Uh, you know, for example, if a young man is tempted to join a conflict, the elders might speak to him and remind him of his duty to protect his own honor, the clan's honor. Or in some occasions, we find that the Nabadon, who is the peace seeker, will speak for hours or sometimes days on end uh, on the value of peace and protection. So this type of peace building is rooted in local authority, I, I find, and it creates a sense of ownership and agency, which can at times be difficult to achieve through external in- interventions. Uh, the other thing that became apparent was the moral authority of elders uh, and the manner in which it functions as a deterrent. Elders are seen as the moral compass of the community and of the clan. They embody both cultural and spiritual values, which allow them allows them to influence behaviour beyond Uh, the formal rules that we often find with the federal government in Somalia or in the major cities. When an elder condemns an action as violating hair or the traditional law, it brings a powerful social disapproval that discourages people from transgressing. Uh, So, for instance, if a clan member violates the protection offered by Birmegeido, they find that not only they face not only legal repercussions, but social dishonor, which Somalis are very weary of. Uh, And so the community collectively reproaches uh, the person. So you see it manifesting as a sort of social deterrent, um, which is at times often more effective than punishment. Um, and the last aspect, I guess, I would relay is the preventative aspect of uh, elders and, and uh, all of the, the mechanisms which they employ. They don't necessarily wait for conflicts to spiral out of control. Instead, you find that they convene uh, regular meetings, often held under a tree, which symbolizes transparency and openness, and they discuss and reinforce the norms of restraint. And poetry, of course, plays a role, a key role here. Through this evocative uh, verses being uh, recited, the poets remind people of the value of peace and the consequences of war, um, and it deters aggression before it even starts on many occasions. Um, so you can imagine a gathering where elder poets recite lines that glorify restraint and condemn recklessness. Um, of course, this is a medium that Somalis deeply respect, and it's a really potent tool for preempting uh, violence. And I would advocate for institutionalizing these gatherings and incorporating poetry and literature broadly as a regular uh, medium for reminding people and communities of the importance of restraint and protection Um if we make these discussions a standard practice, uh, elders can maintain a continuous and proactive influence in the community's adherence to principles of protection. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And and I think it's um, so important to emphasize, you know, the the role of norms, values, custom, religion, um, as well as the sort of moral and legal hierarchies that you have in different contexts such as Somalia and how important they are in promoting restraint, especially in this context that uh, Howda referred to earlier in there, this sort of growing um, erosion of international humanitarian law and international frameworks. And particularly on that, uh, you know, your your points around ownership and agency um, in promoting restraint and preventing violence. Thanks so much. Um, we're a little behind time, so I'll go straight over to um, Elor. Um, 
So you're based there in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, where you have over 100 non-state armed groups active, particularly in the eastern region, high numbers of um, internally displaced people, around 7.2 million, one of the highest levels of IDPs globally. Um, So Can you outline the key challenges that local actors face in the context of the transition and absence of the peacekeeping mission um, and how protection action is a core part of community-led interventions, including the early warning and early response initiatives that that your organisation has been involved with? Over to you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Uh, Thank you very much. You know, in the introduction or in the emails, it was said that we have 1.7 million displaced people in the RC. This figure is uh, very big, which figures uh, is very far from the demography of uh, uh, many countries in the world. And the exacerbation of conflict is something real, unfortunately. Uh, And this coincides with the announcement made uh, with the withdrawal of MONUSCO. This situation can worsen the insecurity at the expense of the the civilians, but also the humanitarian actors that are working for uh, easing the, the suffering of the population. Now, in terms of challenges, there's a problem of access or dangerous access of areas affected by the conflict, the occupation and uh, occupation of villages by the authorities who obey to non-state actors. This is a real problem. And there are reprisals against the local actors who speak of the protection uh, issues and human rights issues, they are seen as enemies and they are seen as uh, people who who go against their values. And there's a confusion by the non-state actors who are not unable to differentiate between the protection and the um, policies. They commit uh, atrocities against uh, humanitarian actors because of this confusion. And then there's a low capacity of the government to uh, impose the authority of the state in some areas. You know, in the work of protection, the authorities, local authorities, are partners, uh, great partners, because many actions that are being led on the field to curb the issue of protection incidents, the local authorities play a great role as a guarantor of peace. And aside that, we have the low capacity of uh, malicious armed groups to understand the humanitarian principles, that is, uh, principles like neutrality or unbiases. And then we also have a problem in relation to the lack of existence of a formal mechanism of whistleblower. And I'm referring to the people who facilitate the functioning of mechanisms of early warning. We have so many realities in DRC. Uh, These realities are not understood by Congolese law. So this reality uh, lived or felt by Congolese people. And when you are trying to question or interrogate the legal framework, you will see that nothing is uh, provided for by the law. And this is a real obstacle. And here, as an example, we can give you the example 
of uh, pseudo crime. There's a legal void concerning ritual crime here in DRC. And if an actor is able to speak against these actions, this person will be condemned for defamation simply because the legal framework does not exist. In DRC, there's no policy uh, on sexual violence in the, the world business, and this affects in a substantial manner development of a category of people simply because nothing is done regarding that. Now, let's talk about the responses. What are we doing? What are we setting up as strategies that can help uh, address all these concerns? You know, we use a classical formula of analysis of risk and protection. Uh, that is the risk equal to threat multiply by time and divided by capacity. And I, I wanted to focus on capacity and the issue of vulnerability. In our context, people are displaced. And when you are a displaced person, you are a vulnerable person. Uh, you know, it's a special status. And the more you delay or you stay in that position, the more you are affected. And it's, it's like it's even more difficult to come back to your uh, original place. And we are trying to work in such a way that we can increase the capacity of local organizations. I'm referring to the local structural protection. I will tell you. Uh, I will not tell you everything, uh, uh, all the organizations. What we do is there's a transfer of skills to increase the leadership at the local level. And this only goes through uh, organizational capacity building because we think that if these organizations are strengthened in capacity, they will be efficient, not only efficient to address the issues of protection, but also this will play a role on their sustainability. And there are material capacities that we are trying to give them. And there's also the financial capacity. The major challenge at this level, despite the challenges that are perceptible, is that the material capacity, the financial capacity are so limited. But for the organizational capacity, we already have uh, an expertise regarding the development of uh, uh, development of these uh, structures. So we have a holistic approach of transfer of skills uh, for the benefit of local actors to increase their leadership uh, at the local level. And why do we do so? Because we understood that when we did the analysis, we understood that the former actors, the former activists of human rights uh, lacked so many things. But with this new method, they are, now have more uh, capacity in terms of uh, uh, humanitarian principle, the increase of their capacity in terms of leadership, etc. And this has decreased the risk to which they used to be exposed, even though uh, there's no uh, zero risk. This contributes a lot to diminish the risks the activists are exposed. Now, what do we do in, in this area? Well, we talked about the access uh, of the beneficiaries. And what do we do? Because some uh, areas are occupied by armed groups. So we facilitate access to the affected areas. 
and, uh, and we also work for the humanitarian uh, groups. We try to follow the directives, and I'm referring to OCHA. We also have an anal analysis of protection before any, uh, before we do, we engage in any activity. We try to do the risk analysis, and this is done with the, the different uh, stakeholders that we interact. We also ensure that there are necessary measures identified in the communities. The, but there are other risks that are not identified by the communities that we can identify at our own level. And we try to do all that by ensuring that the risks are minimized. We also do other activities with a rapid impact. Just, just Sorry to interrupt, just to say that we're running out of time. If you can wrap up. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, ah, okay. Merci, all right, merci. all right. Thank you. Well, as a conclusion, we would say that protection issue is a very important issue in DRC. But we would love other mechanisms, deep mechanism to be uh, also created uh, to improve the current context so that with the withdrawal of MONUSCO, uh, when they leave, the community can be ready or other mechanisms that are already there can be strengthened so uh, they can be a, a perceptible void. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alul. And, uh, and, and sorry to uh, interrupt there. It's such a rich um, background that you've gave us, particularly in terms of how you're strengthening capacities um, and, and promoting local leadership. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for your intervention now. So let's uh, turn over to you now, Anton. Um, so Base UA uh, is an NGO form to, in response to the Russian invasion uh, to resist Russian aggression through humanitarian aid uh, and support to civilians. So can you tell us more about your approach um, in using your presence on the ground um, in, the conf in conflict affected communities in the east of Ukraine to support protection and specifically how you've been working with communities to carry out evacuations from hotspot locations. Sure. Yeah. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Um, I will concentrate on the evacuations because we don't have that much time, but I'm happy to talk about other uh, types of activities as we have uh, a wide range of programs that we implement. Um, being based in Kramatorsk since basically the first days of the invasion, so we are very much part of the communities that we assist and constantly reassess the needs on the ground rather than, you know, trying to kind of push uh, things on the people. Um, evacuation, unfortunately, is still very much relevant. It's what um, we, as many other organizations and actors, kind of uh, started with at the beginning of the invasion. Uh, it was clear that, especially here in the east, uh, in cities like Lysychansk or Severodonetsk, the local administrations were not prepared to evacuate uh, people in an organized manner, um, which is obviously a very sad thing to uh, realize, considering that a city like Severodonetsk was basically on the front line since 2014 and had also lots of international big, big humanitarian actors that were based there. And uh, but they evacuated uh, the day of the invasion. So basically the, the moment where uh, the local population needed them most, they left, which is understandable considering the chaos of the first weeks. But um, it kind of also showed how um, yeah, the, the 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 response wasn't there when it was needed most, and and everyone was kind of catching up uh, later. But that's why civil society actors um, like Base UA, but like also many others, uh, also less less institutionalized and less structured efforts, uh, concentrated on bringing people to safety. 
So I would say the um, there was obviously a huge amount of people uh, from a city like Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, that left themselves. Um, many of them also before the invasion actually started. But people who had their own vehicles, who had enough financial resources, who had places to go. Um, uh, so we always encounter the most vulnerable um, um, a, a few weeks after a conflict like this starts, because those are the people that... Um, either don't have the uh, necessary experience. You have to understand that, especially here in the East, uh, the majority of these people have never left the region. You know, they had um, they had some very stable jobs at a factory or some kind of industrial facility or maybe in the local shop for decades. Um, and, and some of them have not even left their towns more than twice or three times uh, during their whole life. So obviously, imagining to leave um, sometimes is just as scary as to stay. And I would um, I would probably stress that, you know, an evacuation kind of happens in the first few days. Uh, afterwards, um, we would have to come up with a different term because people do adapt quite quickly and 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 it doesn't really happen in 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 a radical manner but you know it, the kind of the, the frog is being boiled day by day and so people lose the sense also of the danger that they're actually experiencing because they you know it, it kind of gets worse and worse that's day by day and they adapt you know they they build communities they um around the bomb shelters obviously very improvised bomb shelters just some kind of a basement and and so they build support structures because there are not enough um, social uh, kind of welfare structures provided by the administrations or by the humanitarian actors. And so people are very much proactive in trying to reestablish some kind of status quo and some kind of agency. Uh, they obviously want to know what's going to happen to them the next day. And, and so um, today, the same way a year ago or two years ago, every time we interact with the community that gets to the point where obviously remaining in a city is very much uh, putting themselves in a mortal danger, we find these structures in place where people have adapted. And, you know, and for example, a city like Siversk, which has been uh, bombarded since the very first days and continues to remain an extremely um, hot area, very close to the front line, um, still has 1,000 people that remain there in a completely destroyed city. Um, but they have adapted. They are in some kind of of sheltering uh, and you know there is basic humanitarian aid being provided pl plus they very much stocked up on 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 food and and things like that and uh, as incredible as it is but people choose to stay in places like this rather than evacuate because um they feel like they control the situation more rather than um going out and and kind of giving themselves to whatever the the humanitarian sector both govern from the government side but also from the humanitarian actors can provide and i think that's an important thing to mention um i'm not sure how much um the guests and and uh, fellow speakers are familiar with the situation in ukraine but there is definitely also a certain narrative or stigmatization of people who refuse to evacuate and um, they're being blamed for you know for yeah basically remaining there um, that is something we very much actively work against because obviously the the aid has to be provided to people that you know uh, feel like that's what they need and uh, and and we obviously try to make sure that people have enough information um that um, they understand that there are many options that they can actually um uh, receive uh but also we very much understand that uh, every family every individual has their own reasons why they don't want to leave and when you actually build relationships with these people and you talk to them quite often they're very logical and adequate and uh, although from outside you know for someone who's coming from a relatively safe space space of uh, safe city it seems uh incredible why would you stay there but once you get into the reality of each individual it might be actually very understandable so we very much avoid judging and try to support um, in any way we can but uh, always kind of obviously involving the beneficiaries and the people uh, um, into this decision making process and uh, the first thing we offer is the evacuation but but if people don't want to for whatever reason then we offer the next best, best thing which is support both in terms of the basic needs but also long-term structural supports for 
especially the vulnerable. We provide medical uh, care, for example, through our mobile clinics. Uh, or in cities like Bakhmut, we used to work with teenagers and kids in the shelters, uh, in these bomb shelters, just to also underline how different the approach could be in each individual case. You know, it's not as straightforward as just going and picking up someone and then bringing them to whatever, uh, to a point B, because uh, that doesn't really solve anything. Uh, so at this point, I would say um, uh, we had these periods where evacuation was uh, more or less relevant. Uh, in 2023, the front line was uh, somewhat stagnating. And so uh, the situation stabilized and there was uh, way many less people evacuating. Currently, obviously, for those who follow the news, uh, we have a disaster situation in, in the south of Donetsk region. Um, the front line is moving extremely fast. And so, um, you know, villages that were relatively safe just a couple couple of weeks ago become extremely dangerous and basically on the contact line um, just a few days later. Uh, so we are very actively uh, now working in, in that space and uh, we try to cover the needs that are not addressed by, um, you know, more kind of streamlined uh, processes, because at this point, there are definitely a lot of efforts from the administrations, from the Nunez region itself. There is a, a streamlined process where, you know, there is a transition shelter and there is uh, an evacuation train that travels from Pavlograd to Dnipro and then to Lviv, to the west of the country. Um, there are um, bigger humanitarian uh, organizations that that um, have like uh, shuttle services going through the major cities where the evacuations are happening from, uh, but they uh, specifically collect people at identified locations. So people have to come there, they have to be informed about it, they have to uh, kind of, you know, uh, go through an extra effort to actually be able to access that service. So Base UA, as also other organizations, we're not unique in that sense. We concentrate on, um, on kind of individual address um, requests. So we you know, literally travel and pick up people from their homes, um, either private homes or from, from buildings where, you know, there are many flats and they work there. And, and we also um, at the end provide mostly assistance to, to also the most, most vulnerable. So elderly uh, people with disabilities, people with restricted mobility, uh, people that, uh, and also from the hottest kind of spots where, uh, you know, these more organized uh, efforts from the government are not accessible anymore, or uh, because there are um, even the police service that does also provide evacuation um, doesn't go to certain areas uh, simply because, yeah, it, they have basically protocols they follow. So, so we try to be that kind of um, um, last resort also for, for people that uh, uh, have decided to leave a bit too late. Um, and, and, and because we have that flexibility, we have a lot of experience. Uh, we have uh, uh, very skilled teams that provide that assistance. We have uh, armored vehicles and a huge network in terms of gathering the intelligence day by day, because at the end, uh, that's what's most important. You know, certain areas could be extremely um, uh, dangerous for a couple of weeks, but then you might have a window where the situation at the front line change and that 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 spot is accessible again. So um, so it's a constant um, kind of uh, mix of monitoring, intel gathering, um, um, scouting as well. We, we go to places where there is no um, no uh, connection anymore, no uh, people so couldn't call and, and you literally have to go door uh, by door and, and just knock and talk to people and uh, register their request for evacuation on the spot and then come back the next day or whenever people are ready. Uh, sometimes you need also to prepare more if, if people have a specific uh, needs that cannot be undressed on the spot. Um, so, yeah, um, it's... it's it, it's a mix of sorry, these... just to, just to ask yeah. to wrap up if that's okay. Yes. Sorry. So it's 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 a it's a very dynamic um, environment where lots of different actors uh, are participating and addressing different needs, uh, and I would say overall the situation is much better than it was two years ago. But unfortunately, uh, as we see, this conflict is not going anywhere, and uh, we would hope that evacuations wouldn't be that necessary anymore. But 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 they are still remain very much relevant at this point. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Uh, and and again, sorry to cut you short. So much, um, yeah, um, really interesting and rich experiences here. And I think 
I think it's really important the emphasis that you've given us on on sort of led you know demonstrating the example of civilian led efforts far before any you know international actor is coming to support um and um yeah and that sort of frontline role um of the, of national and local actors such as yourself um as well as those compromises and dilemmas that you have um but I think also a, a really strong point there on what the benefits of referrals can be when you're working into as a as a local organization into a more international system and linking with international organizations. So thanks very much. And um, I think there's a lot to learn uh, around the role of local and international actors on on evacuations. Um, Sophie, we'll move over to you now. Um, so so Sophie's joining us from UNHCR Chad. Um, and, you know, in Chad, you have um, extremely high um, levels of displacement, 1.7 million displaced, including 1.2 million refugees from uh, Sudan, Central Africa Republic, Cameroon, as well as uh, rising insecurity around Lake Chad and intercommunal violence. So, with that context, how is UNHCR and its partners, um, how can you more effectively support local communities and frontline responders um, who are, as we've heard in many of the interventions today, uh, often the fair to provide assistance, um, but operate often with such limited resources um, and access to protection? Merci beaucoup de me passer la parole et... Thank you for giving me the floor. Before responding to your question, allow me to share with you some uh, contextual elements. I've shared a map. I don't know if it could be shared on the screen. Yes. Chad is surrounded by uh, six countries that are facing uh, instability security instability and because of that instability many people are into forced displacement just let me give you the example of sudan where the conflict is still ongoing and uh, is uh, still pushing people to leave and uh, joining the eastern part of Chad. You can see that there is a high number of people who are displaced at the eastern part of Chad. Chad is part of international conventions and uh, has developed laws at the national level which are the legal basis on which we can focus to support and provide assistance and protection to people in this displacement situation. Despite the efforts made by uh, the Chad authorities in order to ensure security all along the borders, we are witnessing a, uh, an increasing number of insecurity cases at the settlement sites of people due to proliferation of uh, weapons. And in this context, communities are exposed to protection risks and uh, have decided to get organized themselves. They got in touch with uh, HCR and its partners and we carried out uh, assessments within those communities in order to listen to them and understand the dynamic of the situation and uh, the momentum of protection and security in that uh, co community. We have seen that uh, there are this proliferation of women, uh, weapons, sorry, and various incidents are reported. The communities need to be strengthens despite the fact that they are already organized. So HCR in collaboration with its partners have developed uh, mechanisms and uh, HCR had a partner already called the Department for Refugees Protection and uh, Humanitarian Protection. That's a, a branch of National uh, Gendarmerie, which was ensuring the protection of civilians with uh, patrols in order to identify uh, insecurity cases and uh, to find solutions. In the same vein, HCR, in collaboration with its partners, have implemented 
or has strengthened uh, mixed peace communities that uh, bring together populations or housing populations and the people that are forcibly displaced. And the role of this group is to prevent conflict cases and to prevent or deal with uh, problems that may arise in these communities, especially regarding uh, peaceful co uh, coexistence. And uh, these host communities have welcomed the displaced people despite their vulnerability and uh, if sometimes the presence of uh, these people, the displaced people, exacerbates the vulnerability of the people that are hosting them. We've also uh, created watchdog communities to prevent these kinds of insecurities, and uh, this uh, group is working in collaboration with the branch of refugees protection and humanitarian protection. Uh, they carry out night patrols in order to identify banditry cases and uh, identify those who are threatening their uh, security of the communities. And their role is to identify and uh, arrest people and together with the Department of Gendarmerie, which will uh, uh, work on uh, preparing a report, report that is sent to the uh, court. There is a capacity building activity as well, and uh, the various groups have seen their capacities being built on protection thematics and also on uh, the risks of protection risk. This helped them to identify very quickly the threats and vulnerabilities as well as protection risks that they are exposed to. And as a result of this capacity building activity, they were even able to report cases through another mechanism in place called the feedback mechanism. We've set up information and feedback centers through which this uh, watchdog communities called the uh, report incidents related to uh, conflicts, risk of insecurity of cases identified in order to share that information. Uh, in addition, following the demand of the community, there is a strengthening uh, of the communities of in order to uh, highlight um, we gave them materials, be it cars or motorbikes, to support them in early warning in order to allow them to report very quickly any incidents that may happen. There is also a coordination mechanism in place and uh, in the framework of uh, weekly meetings, the MIS committee and watchdog committee, as well as uh, the Department for Refugees Protection, as well as the Eligibility Commission, which is a part, uh, governmental partner, come together and share information regarding the various incidents. The MIS committee on peaceful coexistence, organize monthly meetings to identify uh, potential cases or if cases of conflicts have been solved, they share those information. Another need is the need for capacity building is still huge. We are still in emergency. We welcome a lot of refugees, and the communities need to be strengthened the more because we have limited resources, and we are trying to work in collaboration with other partners and the community in order to face uh, or to organize civilians' protection. And the, the, the vigilants are also involved in night patrols 
So we organized capacity building for them in order to see how they could protect themselves. So we give them information on the observance of some principles so that they could uh, avoid facing insecurity situations when they are conducting their activities. I will stop for now because we have many things to say, but we are short of time. We have all the categories of protection here, civilians protection, remains a huge challenge which will need uh, more capacity building of uh, communities so that they could learn how to protect themselves and we need to strengthen the existing mechanisms in order to make them sustainable i thank you Many thanks to that, Sophie. Um, and I think uh, uh, more uh, other sort of really strong examples of um, community-led early warning um, and early response mechanisms among among the many that you've uh, presented. So um, just before we go on to, on to you, Nai, um, just to let you know, because of time, we may not get to the Q&A. Um, so what we're doing is putting those back in the chat and panellists. If you can look out for your name, um, if you can start answering those questions in the chat, it would be really helpful. Um, and perhaps we can carry on the conversation there in case we don't get to it. But um, Nai, so Nai is from uh, GCR in Mozambique, um, the, the technical director of GCR. So sorry uh, for, for missing off at your introduction earlier, Nai. Um, so maybe from if you can give us a perspective from Mozambique um, on how local community mechanisms also, you know, I know you're going to speak a bit more about early warning systems too and other examples of informal protection networks. So how they support and enhance the efforts of protection actors um, and how these actors in turn strengthen community initiatives, that, uh, that two-way support, if you like. Over to you. Thank you for having me. Uh... Just maybe a quick introduction in terms of Mozambique, just to say that for the past five decades, Mozambique has been going from one type of conflict to another. Uh, we're talking about in the 1960s, uh, whereby uh, there was uh, armed conflict in terms of uh, working to get independence. But then in the 1975, then there was a blood civil war that actually resulted in a displacement of many people and refugees in the neighboring countries. And then currently, as we are speaking now, Mozambique is undergoing another conflict with some non-state actors, which has as well displaced more than uh, a million people uh, in the northern part of the country in Cabo Delegado. So having gone through, for example, more than five decades of, of, of different types of conflict, the communities in Mozambique, they have sort of like adapted uh, from different one situation to another, whereby uh, we, we may also want maybe to, to understand that each and different type of conflict is different. And then there's always a different mechanism in terms of how they respond. So I'd like looking at Cap Delgado, which is in the northern part of the country, where most of the current conflict is happening uh, in terms of for uh, the only uh, early warning system. Uh, it is very important, I think, from our interventions, what we've really learned is that the communities are actually part and parcel. They are the first uh, liners in terms of responding, and actually they are the first ones actually to get the information. Our experience maybe in different contexts in Mozambique is that sometimes even the government or even some international organizations and even the protection cluster might have some informal information about possible maybe conflict happening in those areas. But for some reason, because the local uh, community protection mechanism, sometimes they may not be seen as credible and some people may not be even trusting that the information that is coming from them is reliable. And to the extent that sometimes when actual something very serious and when maybe people are starting to flee, then people, they start actually to give them merit to say that, oh, by the way, the information that has been shared has been actually very reliable. We didn't act on it and we're so late to the extent that sometimes there's more, even more harm because of that. So as uh, this happens, I think my organization, Girl Child Rights, just among any other organizations working in Mozambique, especially within the protection sector, we have been working specifically to strengthen 
the community mechanism, especially working with the community leaders who are the custodian of the culture, who are the custodian of the local language, who are the custodian. They know everything in and out of those communities. And as those communities are evolving, or for example, if there is a conflict that is coming, they are actually able to detect some local dynamics that takes place, and they actually start to see that maybe some things here are not okay. By so doing, they also have a very good fabric in terms of how do they circulate information informally within their networks. I am talking from experience. Uh, I was part of uh, the people when we were growing up affected by the civil society, uh, by the uh, civil war. And I very remember very well when I was young that we used to actually decamp and go and sleep in the forest with my parents. By so doing, and I still remember that even as to such tender age, we were not even able to cry during at night because we know that it was a matter of life and death, you can imagine. And then as, as these things happened, then we started to see different dynamics taking place. For example, what the communities here in Mozambique sometimes they do is you can actually see people going, maybe they're heading kettles or maybe they're going to fetch water, but actually they are the custodian and they're the people who are carrying information and they are actually feeding that information to the community leaders to the extent that they actually say if they see any suspicious movement within their communities, before you know it, the leaders, they already have the information. Before you know it, all the network within those communities they already know what is happening. So what we've seen, I think, over the years in, in terms of the experience is that there has not been some uh, recognition or maybe some investment in terms of this valuable protection local mechanism that is uh, within the area because they're already there. So what is required maybe is actually to ensure that we foster and we enhance their capacities. What we've done also in one of the areas is actually working with them to provide them with some communication assistance in the form of telephones in the terms of cell phones so that they can actually have a much bigger uh, way of sending or communicating information within those networks so that if maybe there is an imminent threat uh, they then able to actually communicate and by so doing you can actually see that the community sometimes during the day they do their business as usual but at night, they all decamp and they all, all go and actually hide and sleep in the bush. And then the next day, they come and continue business as usual. Why? Because they've got some information to know that maybe some non-state uh, actors, they are going to attack uh, on such a day. And they prepare themselves to ensure that they have that capacity. So I, I think something to take home, I think, from here is to ensure that I think there is a need because they normally, uh, the communities, they work without much support or without much investment. And as international organizations, there is a real need to ensure that this fabric, this community local led uh, is actually supported. Uh, they need support in terms of uh, capacity building. They also need support in terms of communication mechanisms so that they're able then to reach to the other members within their network. So maybe I will sort of like looking at the early warning system, given that we don't have much time. And I know maybe people, they want to get into the question and answer, which also might be very much valuable. But I think for us, uh, in terms of making sure that we move ahead, uh, ahead, there is a really need to ensure that there is greater investment, working with the community leaders, actually understanding from their perspective, what type of support they need to ensure that they continue to foster the community protection mechanism. They are not only the local leaders. We also work with what we call child protection uh, committees, which is also uh, committees that are made by community members in terms of protecting different types of uh, violence that normally happen within the context of armed conflict. But due to time, maybe you can allow me to stop here so that maybe we can benefit from the Q&A. I thank you. Thank you so much, Nay, and thank you. Uh, thanks for, for keeping it within time. Really appreciate that. Uh, and I think something that you've mentioned there uh, is very much in line with with some of the work that we've been doing and the, the findings we made that I'm sure will speak to all of you and many of you that are, that are on this call, which is, you know, that support, not only sort of emphasising the credibility and the legitimacy that local leaders and local um, communities have, 
on some on on some levels, but also support to um, communications, to joining different actors to one another. And I think that's very much um, a, a role that national and international actors working with communities and working with uh, community leadership um, can play in terms of that bridging role between be it from one community to another, be it from a community to an armed actor or even to uh, to international humanitarian actors, for example. Um, so, yeah, thank thank you so much for that. Um, we're quite up against time, um, so I'll I'll um, go quite quickly on one question for you, Ayan, um, at the moment. But as I say, all of all of our excellent panelists, we've got so many questions coming in. So if you can look in the chat, um, if we don't get to you, maybe you can answer some people from there. But uh, Ayan, there was one for you about. Um, how how you situate IHL within the traditional norms, um, both the sort of moral and and Sharia legal um, frameworks, and and how that's situated, and when people are using those, and you're working to promote restraint, um, whether people are justifying their actions through those same norms, whether that's both through the use of violence as well as through promoting restraint and or whether they reject those norms. So, you know, these overlaying of of the different frameworks, both moral, legal, national, international, um, and yeah, restraint as well as violence, quite a lot there. And we'll try to be a bit quick. <laughs> yeah, this, I think this was a question from Sajida. Uh, thank you for that insightful question. I, I find that the relationship between proponents of war, uh, like warlords, and the traditional Somali norms that we've got are indeed very complex. The first thing that I can affirm is that these norms can never be rejected. They're very institutional and very entrenched. They've been there for centuries and they've never been refused. Uh, the Birmagedo is not capable of being refused either. It is possible that they are not followed on occasion, but they can never be refused. I think the normative legitimacy definitely remains intact. And I would opinion that in many cases um, on the sort of warlord terrorism uh, side, groups like al-Shabaab will definitely operate outside the traditional structures. And they're often very driven by their own political and ideological agendas. Uh, I would distinguish that from inter-clan warfare uh, as these tend to cease at some point and there's a return to the tradition. Um, groups like al-Shabaab are in direct conflict with these principles uh, where you know, there's a prioritization of civilian protection and communal accountability. Um, a lot of clerics will easily declare and tell you that their actions are absolutely outside of the Sharia and outside of uh, the traditional Somali laws. Um, and this is also the case where we see the federal government constantly denouncing um, groups like Al Shabaab. At the same time, there are instances in, in inter clan warfare, so it's not completely unusual for a clan, uh, for clan militants to attempt to justify their actions by selectively invoking these uh, laws or Islamic principles. Um, but to conclude, the traditional laws of war are very, very important in the administration of justice um, and in the maintenance of peace, particularly in rural townships. One of the groups of uh, one of the groups that I interviewed, it was um, the National Council of Elders for Peace and Reconciliation. They explained the inconsistency that has recently emerged between the federal and state laws and the traditional laws which govern hostilities. Uh, I was given the example that uh, often young members from the federal government will come to uh, these post-conflict zones and will attempt the traditional reconciliation without actually engaging in the full traditional process. Um, they'll attempt to just give the monetary compensation without actually engaging and, and ensuring that people and transgressors know they're wrong. Um, so it's not a complete uh, practice of the tradition. And so... Uh, there's a bit of an agitation there, but what remains clear is that the traditional laws of war still carry much legitimacy and they're very much preferred um, in, in especially conflict-prone zones. Um, and that's because there's definitely a sense of ownership and a familiarity that's expressed. Thank you. Thanks so much. And, uh, and again, I think it's really important to you know, to emphasize from yours and and others, we we also found similar findings in some of the work that we've done on, you know, what what has legitimacy um, and what what has that weight, um, which is which is your entry point for influence in anything, um, and particularly for international actors that are uh, that are listening in um, to really think through 
where then is your entry point um, based on be it sort of moral codes and norms, the customs, um, and how do you then sort of work towards a more IHL dialogue, but based on on what has credibility and what is owned by communities. So really fascinating work, I am. Thank you. Um, thank you. There was a, thank you. <laughs> there was a couple of uh, questions for, for you, Anton. Um, so we'll come quickly to you. Um, one around uh, whether whether your organisation has been involved in negotiations towards the establishment of protected areas in Ukraine um, and, and what that looked like and what lessons can be learned. Um, and then I think also a bit more reflection on what actions international actors can take to support um, the actions that, that you, know, you, your organisation and other civil society actors are taking in conflict areas in Ukraine? Sure. Um, at the very beginning, WHO specifically and certain other UN agencies tried to implement some procedures that maybe have worked for them in other conflict areas. So, you know, the conflicting special specific routes or uh, the conflicting sites that has completely failed or just never really worked and very quickly big actors like MSF um, moved away from whatever they were doing, trying to inform, uh, most importantly, the Russian um, side uh, regarding their movements, because um, although they never could really establish a 100 percent causality, but they felt like they were actually more targeted when they informed about their movements. Uh, so uh, definitely there is nothing like that in place. There is no communication with the um, Russian army. Uh, there is obviously a lot of coordination with the Ukrainian army, with the civilian military coordination officers, uh, with the local police, with the administration, with local, ad uh, local uh, village leaders, street leaders. That coordination is absolutely crucial to make sure that a safe evacuation is still possible. And also in terms of just monitoring um, and passing on uh, requests, uh, the coordination uh, between local actors and local administrations and the military is very important. And it happens uh, all the time. But again, um, it kind of happens on a very specific and individual case-by-case um, -case kind of situation. So every village, every city is different. And what was um, relevant two years ago, you know, is very different today. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 but that coordination takes place and it's crucial. And I think uh, international big organizations uh, could very much support that coordination because it happens, but it doesn't happen enough. So there is still a lot of, um, I would say, Say, and as far as we are concerned, and I hear this from many organizations, the cluster system does not really work in Ukraine. It's not really showing the results that maybe, um, you know, we have experienced in other places. Uh, I, th I think I was uh, in Gaza in summer and I feel like cluster uh, system in Gaza is uh, showing very good results. But in Ukraine, probably because of the scale, because of the amount of uh, actors, both governmental and non-governmental, um, it, it's not really working. So the coordination happens much more, uh, it's much more localized. And uh, and I think big international actors could step up there and, and maybe um, really have resources, both human resources and financial resources dedicated to that because that's where we really lack that support because, um, you know, local actors coordinating among themselves struggle to maintain specific structures because we're so much involved in the work in the field. So having like an additional administrative apparatus, like a team that would uh, would take on that full term coordination could be very, very effective. I've been advocating for that with all our international partners. Um, both to support maybe some kind of humanitarian volunteers hubs, uh, but also the digital infrastructure, of course. So, um, yeah, th there is a lot of um, improvements that can be done there because uh, lack of coordination produces, you know, uh, um, just a lot of uh, resource, resource wasting, you know, when you have three vehicles going to pick up five cars rather than just one vehicle and also the whole inter intel gathering and, and all of that, that can be much, much, much improved through coordination for sure. Thanks very much. And I think um, 
Yeah, I think that's really relevant points around um, what it, what could effective coordination look like and an effective support to you. And I know that we've heard loud and clear from so many of the national, international um, organisations and civilians we've been working with to say, you know, yeah, humanitarian coordination systems, sorry for those on the call who are a part of it, but are really quite irrelevant when you're trying to prevent, reduce, evacuate, and you need the flexibility to do so. Um, and I think also, you know, really bearing in mind that, you know, whatever coordination looks like, taking away this whole, you know, the notion of humanitarian coordination architecture, or at least parking it for a while, um, but really pushing that to as close to you know, the the area as is possible with all actors involved that need to be there um, so that we're getting around the bureaucracies and really making something that enables the support that, that organisations like yourselves need. Um, as you were talking, Anton, as well, it reminded me that I think one of the critical roles that international um, actors can take, and this has certainly come up in our work as well, um, and and the, the people we've interacted with, um, is the not only facilitation role that international actors can can make, but also the resources that they can provide. Sometimes it really is a provision of resources and the right resources, but listening to to what resources by, might be need, needed and for what and where. Um, and of course, that will come when particularly in situations like yourself with, with dilemmas, with compromises, um, with tensions, but at the same time, um, I think there's, you know, we've 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 really heard loud and clear how much a pragmatic approach is required if you really want to support approaches to, you know, evacuations, reducing violence, preventing violence, that kind of thing. And just um, maybe a quick quick point to that as well. I think the biggest, biggest, biggest issue uh, regarding evacuations, but the coordination in general, that there is a huge focus on this kind of first leg, you know, here at the front line. And there is mm. much, much less focus on what happens to these people once they left these dangerous areas. Right. But that's actually where their problems start. And, and I and I feel like it's massively, massively unaddressed, you know, like uh, what what these people receive in terms of assistance is is the most basic kind of level that you can uh, imagine. And I think two and a half years into this war is kind of unacceptable, to be honest. And it's also a time bomb because we have six and a half million IDPs the total majority of them in very precarious situations. Uh, and each day that goes by, they're more and more kind of uh, losing, you know, uh, everything that you need to be part of, of an active uh, society. And it's going to be by with each day more and more difficult to reintegrate them. And, and, and uh, obviously considering that we also have to rebuild this country, it's a huge, huge issue that I feel is not being addressed enough at all. And not, not even in terms of talking about it and even less so with, with actual hands-on uh, projects and activities because it's so difficult because it's such a huge, huge problem that, you know, needs very complex uh, and very structured responses. And, and everyone is kind of focused on, on these more superficial, quantifiable emergency responses. Um, but um, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's definitely something that we should try to concentrate more on. Yeah, absolutely. And again, emphasizing the need for really context specific approaches, listening to people um, and not having these sort of top down cookie cutter, if you like, approaches that, that humanitarian responses sadly so, so often have and are, are, are set up to deliver. Um, we could go on. We're really up against time. So um, and and we want to bring in Tiffany uh, from Nonviolent Peace Force before to to end for us. But before we do that, just to give other panelists that, that haven't had the chance to come back in, if you have any final um, words you want to say, just literally one minute if you can, because we're so behind time. So Nyai, Sophie, and Elu, um, if you're if if there's any any one point that you st want to make before before we hand over to Tiffany to close for us. Who would like to come in first? And don't feel the need that you have to if you don't uh, if you don't want to. Sophie, you're on mute. This. No? Uh, yeah, go for it. I would like to je voudrais répondre à la question. I would like to respond. I have a question which is addressed to me. They would like to know what is the collaboration between the communities and the police or 
the military in the field. Allow me to say that uh, communities are informed that they could uh, share their problems with the police. And uh, here in our context, it's uh, the Department for Refugees Protection and the Humanitarians, which is a branch of the Gendarmerie. They play the role of the legal police uh, around the refugee settlements and inside those settlements. And uh, they are the ones preparing the minutes for the courts. And if the communities want their problems to be solved at the level of justice, but generally communities, for because of uh, our customs, prefer friendly settlements, which means that their problems are solved within the communities, even though the departments of refugees protection is uh, informed about what is happening. Their relationship is quite good, but uh, when this is a major conflict, these conflicts are shared within those communities. When these conflicts are minors, that's what I can share with you. And as I was saying, the need to be strengthened because we are sure that this constitute, when they are truly strengthened, they could be sustainable and solve a lot of issues. In addition, they can uh, help in uh, encouraging humanitarian interventions in uh, these conditions, as well as encouraging civilians' protection in an environment where we are facing a lot of difficulties regarding protection programs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie, um, and for trying to wrap up quickly. So, Nai, we'll go to you. Um, one minute, if you can, and then over to you, El Elor. After. Yes, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, the community protection uh, system, in as much as I explained, uh, it's not like a standalone thing. So, it actually fits within the bigger the bigger picture. So. Uh, given uh, the fact that it is actually on the basic community structures, but then it fits within the other systems, which also in our case, uh, uh, it fits uh, within, for example, uh, we have like the police, the healthcare, we have social services and the justice system, but then also it fits within the uh, protection clusters, which could be maybe at local level and also within across the broader protection a cluster which is at the national level. So I think lessons to take there is then how do we ensure that uh, there is this uh, effective investment uh, of the uh, L warning system that is actually embedded within the community so that it can actually then reflect in terms of the protection needs of the civilians, uh, especially when they want it, uh, given the fact that they're already there within the system. And all what mm -hmm. needs to be done maybe is to ensure that it is strengthened and then that is actually responsive in terms of prov uh, providing protection to, to the civilians. So this is what I wanted just to emphasize. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And Lord, over to you. Very short, please. Merci beaucoup. En fait, Thank you so much. After following all the presentations, I'm figuring out that uh, the, there is a, the protection is cross-cutting and I'm wondering if it's not be possible to capitalize on, on our experiences and put it in a book that we could share with people because I've understood that there are examples in Mozambique, in Chad, that could be used and uh, that we could learn from here in DRC. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. That's excellent. So, thanks so much. And I think actually um, takes us nicely, I hope, onto, uh, onto Tiffany's closing point, because I think one one point um, that, that certainly I know that Nonviolent Peace Force um, have been working on for some years is is building a community of practice to enable exactly this as you were speaking about. So I think an excellent entry point on putting different organizations together to learn from one another and encourage that that peer learning. Um, but Tiffany, you've been waiting so patiently and thank you for everyone on the call. We'll go a few minutes over 
But Tiffany, uh, East Dom, uh, the executive director of Nonviolent Peace Force, it would be, it's, yeah, brilliant to hand over to you to say a few final remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, and first and foremost, thanks to everybody on the panel. Uh, I've been furiously taking notes and, and really getting lost in your stories and, and um, inspired and learning from everything that has been said. Um, it, what really struck me in some of the examples, if we were to literally add up what this panel represents in terms of protection concerns, is we are literally speaking about millions of people. And as soon as we say millions, it's easy to start to, to tune out. It's too big, it's too much. And then so the next layer down reflecting on that is thinking about what, what do we mean by millions of people? It's millions of people like us. And there's there's no point in this world right now that's not at risk that's not at risk for a, for a social cohesion breakdown. There's no place in this world that's not at risk for, for intercommunal violence to be breaking out and more serious, larger scale violence to be breaking out. There couldn't be a more important time for us to be having these conversations and to be wrestling with these really difficult, um, uh, complex problems that we are collectively facing. I feel like that the, one of the sort of this important, and we started so well in this key, in, at the beginning of this conversation, is to remind ourselves that self-protection is not new. It might be buzzwording in our humanitarian world, uh, in the clusters and in, in our humanitarian architecture and all of that. But since the beginning of the time, people who have been at risk have protected themselves. Communities who have been at risk have protected themselves. And, and I think it helps to hear stories, particularly from people who are both working in and working on and living in conflict um, that they and their families and the communities are directly affected by to remind ourselves that that it has to be the place that we stay and that radical centering of those most impacted by violence is the only way through. And for those of us who are lucky enough at this point in time to not be directly affected by those conflicts who are coming through the whatever aspect we have and in, in whatever part of the system we represent, to help is what we are hearing. And from concrete examples given by our panelists is that when we do work together and we pool our resources and we really listen, that we are collectively safer. That mutual protection, that we collectively keep ourselves safer if we work together. And that does require deep reflection and a willingness to consider what, what is in this moment everybody's best roles and to hear we heard calls for flexibility we heard calls for adaptability we heard calls not to do business as usual and that protection won't come through a log frame and it won't come through a toolbox or a checklist protection and really meaningful safety security paradigm changing ways of, of of social cohesion and collaborative living will only come from a way where we can more collaboratively and more meaningfully recenter and reconsider who is the most important person or group of persons in any given situation. There's extraordinary work and efforts being done in all of these countries and all the other locations right now where people need help, where people are helping themselves and where helpers are there to help them. There are flaws in the system. Every system has its flaws, some bigger than others. We all know that. Um, and some, some that may not be recoverable and just need to be changed and some that can be changed. That doesn't negate the, the, the extraordinary commitment and intention and, and support of the individuals within. And it can be very easy. We're in, we're in a time where it's really easy to break down to us and them thinking. And we just, I, I think we have a real opportunity here listening to, to and being inspired by our panelists today to really remind ourselves that pulling together uh, and with the idea that those most, po most impacted in that moment when we're pulling together should be leading the way is the way through. Uh, so I just want to thank everybody for your time and for, for sharing of yourselves um, and, and what your experiences are. And I, I, I'm coming away from this more inspired and I feel more educated to go forward in my own work. So thanks everybody. Thanks for the invitation to participate. Excellent. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you to all the speakers, to you, Gemma. Thanks a lot for uh, your moderation. It was excellent. And uh, I, I would like just to go back to the call from Elour to compile these practices and these examples and to enrich uh, 
uh, our experience with all what's happening in the in the field so i think that uh, with the new edition of the protection armed conflict toolkit we will try to uh, as unscr in collaboration with the global protection cluster and all the agencies represented here with ocha co-organizing with us this event as well and non-violent peace force we will try to add more examples practices in order for uh, the humanitarian actors to benefit from uh, this rich uh, experience thank you very much and see you and next year global protection forum while following the rest of the events in the coming days bye bye thank you